um, detain somebody on reasonable grounds or if you have a stronger uh, cause or reason to believe then you can um, detain somebody on probable cause. Now then the police then carries out an investigation and thereafter you Oh, I, if I'm going to prosecute, then or I have to then look at this with objective grounds and see that we can prove our case and that there's sufficient reason to prosecute, to issue proceedings. And then it's the court that decides on the issue of guilt. Now, as regards this particular investigation, I believe that we have, in fact, come as far as we can uh, with regard to the investigation. Um, what we're going to be presenting to you this morning is that there's one particular person, one suspect, that we somehow can't get round, as it were, and that person that we're talking about is Mr Stieg Enstrom, uh, who in the press has been called the Scandia Man. And Stieg Engstrom is deceased, and therefore I am not able to uh, start proceedings or even interview him, which is why we, uh, my decision is to discontinue this investigation uh, since the suspect is deceased. Now I would like to ask Milanda to tell us a little bit about the investigation and how it has been conducted. Well, we can see and say that this is one of the biggest police investigations in the world. It's often compared with the assassination of JFK and even also with the Lopkeby bombing. And if we look to Sweden, then of course it is by far Sweden's biggest criminal investigation ever. And we talk about the murder of two people in Linköping and the laser man and Peter Mangs and the Hager man, Peter Mangs in Malmö. And none of these investigations are anywhere near as large as the Palmer investigation. So it's been ongoing since 1986 and has been handled by the Palmer Investigation Group of the Investigations Section at the Department of National Operations. Uh, statistics, people always like statistics, it's interesting, and I suppose we could start by saying that since 2017 we've been uh, working on a project digitalizing this entire investigation. So this is ongoing still actually as we speak. and. It's only fairly recently that we've been able to read different documents on screen. Up until now, we've always had to read paper documents. And this is a huge improvement that we can read documents on screen instead. And the investigation contains over 22,430 different entries and I'm saying entries and here, and I know that many people in the media use the word track or lead, lead, and to lead to me that's fingerprint or it might be a footprint or something like that. I'm going to say um, the Swedish word upslag, which is the word that we've used for a sort of something that is akin to a lead. And a lead might be, uh, or one of these entries, or what we're going to call them, it could, might be uh, an A4 uh, sheet, that, or it might be so many documents that it corresponds to a normal murder investigation. So these entries, or these items, they vary to a large extent. About 90,000 people have been part of the investigation, and also, there are 40,000 people who are mentioned sort of on the periphery. And interviews have been held with over 10,000 people. And many of these have, in fact, been heard several times. And I think the person who's been heard most is a man called Sige Siedegrian. He was a well-known uh, owner of a, a cl club and also uh, he was a drug dealer and he was part of this group. He's been heard in fact 43 times in all. And 
There are about just over uh, 4,000 vehicles included in this investigation, 134 people who have confessed to the assassination. And of these, uh, uh, 29 uh, have confessed directly to the police, and the others have confessed to another person who in turn has then contacted us and told us about it. Now, if we look at the issue of the weapon, this is, of course, a central, uh, interesting part of the investigation. Now, two bullets were found on the road, Sviavi again, after the assassination. First on the 1st of March, on the western part of Sviavergen, and this was a bullet which probably was the one that hurt uh, and injured Lisbeth Palme. And the second bullet was found on the 2nd of March. This was the bullet that killed the Prime Minister, and that was found just a couple of metres from, from the actual scene. And the bullets are Winchester bullets, metal piercing. Uh, Winchester bullets, calibre 357 Magnum. And when you say 357 Magnum, then of course it's you kind of think that we're talking about strong, big bullets, but we're not talking about that at all, actually. There's, in Sweden, for example, it's about nine millimetres, actually, and that's the size that is used in, for a u usual uh, rifle in Sweden. Or a, uh, uh, I think that slightly longer and, in fact, has more gunpowder in it, stronger charging, which is why the ammunition is stronger. And moreover, the bullets are made of lead with uh, copper as well. And as you can hear from the name, they are, to a certain extent, um, metal, uh, the metal piercing, have a metal piercing. and. That tells us how thick the metal is. Unfortunately, there are very few uh, tracks on the on the uh, bullets, and also because they have been hit the building and the street, um, they've also been damaged to a certain extent. And the bullets have been examined by the SKL, the Forensic Laboratory in Stockholm, and they've been examined by uh, Bundeskriminal Amt in Germany as well. And they've also been to the FBI in the United States as well. And there are so few tracks on them that there is not much to, you can't say uh, even that they've been shot using the same gun. However, there's no doubt that these are the bullets in question that have murdered and injured the couple because the uh, the lead isotope composition is the same in both of these when it comes to the lead residue on their clothes both on their clothes and actually on the bullets so they haven't been put there or been exchanged for anything else these are the bullets that were used and the bullets have uh, tracks after uh, the, uh, from 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 the gun, and um, that leads us to assume a number of different types of guns that we used that might have been used, and the most common is the Smith and Wesson. Uh, pre earlier, we had a list of seven different uh, makers. We had Smith and uh, Wesson, Taurus, Yama. Ruby, Escadine, and Kasnar. But more recently, NFC, the National Forensic Center, has looked more closely at this and arrived at two further uh, makers, and it's, it's Kunan and Rugo. And Kunan, we don't think that that comes into question because there are no empty uh, shells on the site. And there is nothing that tells us that the, the um, perpetrator or anybody else has picked up any empty shells. Also, there is information telling us that, we th that, this, that the weapon was, in fact, a revolver. And if we then take, take a look at the length of the pipe, then that is, in all probability, we're talking about something which is four inches long, that i.e. about 10 centimeters long. 
And the reason why we say that is that the bullets that have been in this uh, shot from a, a, a shorter gun, they show uh, a different, there are different aspects of the back of the bullet, uh, base extension. And this is a phenomenon that we see when the powder sort of goes forward into the, the front of the, the, the gun and it's propelled and the pressure is so great from behind so it sort of mushrooms as it were becomes all and we can't see any signs of that on the bullets so therefore we can say that it must have been at least four inches in length. And according to NFC, the National Forensic Center, they have tested, uh, test fired 788 weapons and looked at many different bullets to see whether there are any similarities between those bullets and the bullets in question. Now, unfortunately, NFC are now saying that it would be very difficult, if it impossible, to link a weapon, an actual weapon, to the bullets. Bearing in mind that the, the tracks on the bullets are, are there are few, they've been damaged, and also bearing in mind what's happened with the gun during the time from then to now, um, it might be that the weapon might uh, give rise to completely different traces on the bullets today than they did in 1986, which is why they don't think that it's possible to link a, a weapon to the bullets in question, unfortunately. I would like to say, to give a couple of brief examples of uh, interesting leads we've been working on in the past years. The first person of interest was the so-called 33-year-old man. This is a man from Blekinge in southern Sweden, who at the time lived in Nosbor in southern Stockholm. He was very interested of weapons. He disliked the prime minister. He was uh, at a cafe at Kungsgatan Street at the time, as uh, he would usually do. He talked to other patrons uh, of the cafe, and because of that, and based on the witness statements collected from the other patrons, you could say that he is not a potential perpetrator, because at the time, he was at the cafe and couldn't at the same time be at the scene of the crime. Krista Patterson, all of you know about him, a uh, substance abuser from Solentun in northern uh, Stockholm. He was found guilty and then he was acquitted in 1989. He was acquitted unanimously by the Court of Appeal and found guilty by a non-unanimous district court. The Court of Appeal stated that probably he was outside of the Grand Cinema at the time. Elizabeth Palmer has identified Krista Patterson during a lineup. The lineup, you can have different opinions about how the lineup was conducted. And you should also be aware that what Elizabeth Palmer said is that she identified the person who saw who she saw when she turned around and looked up. She didn't see the actual moment of the shooting. She didn't see who fired the weapon. But she says that Krista Petterson is the person she saw when she turned around. It uh, would be interesting to keep that in mind. We have a Krista A. He is, or he was, 33 at the time. He lived at Helsinki Garten Street, not far from the uh, crime scene. He was in legal possession of a Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum, and when he was about to present the weapon, he didn't manage to. He said that he sold the weapon to, to a young person he met at the uh, Kungstra Gordon Park in central Stockholm. We haven't managed to recover this weapon, unfortunately. And Chris uh, is, uh, has passed away. He passed in 2008. These three individuals are interesting 
for the investigation because these are actual persons who were at least close to the uh, scene of the assassination. Then there is a large number of leads which uh, deal more with the issue of motive. You have an idea about a motive for the assassination, but they have we haven't been managed we haven't managed to link any of the persons to the scene. Just to mention a couple of these leads, we can mention the PKK. It was Hans Holmes, big lead, which he believed a lot in PKK is an organization. Uh, this is uh, Kurdistan's Workers' Party, and uh, they were fighting with Turkey for free Kurdistan at the time. They have committed prior murders in Sweden, one at Medberg Platz in Stockholm, and one in Uppsala. A large raid against the members of organizations was uh, conducted. About 20 people were taken in and were questioned, but they were released because the suspicions against those individuals, individuals were not strong enough. Soon after that, the decision was made that Hans Kulmer would resign from the investigation. South Africa. Uh, personally, I believe that this is quite an interesting lead due to quite specific uh, motives. The problem is, uh, is that you cannot get any specific information. South Africa was discussed extensively. A number of people have contacted us, uh, providing interesting views with respect to this lead. Unfortunately, there's uh, not enough specific information to do something about this lead. The police theory, this is uh, the a number of leads which have been named to the police theory by the media. It's about the police officers, individual police officers, groups of police officers, sometimes corroborating with other group of professionals, mainly members of the military. Even when it comes to this theory, there's nothing specific which gives an opportunity to, to consider this particular lead. If we go back to, to, to today's composition of the Parliament Investigation Group, then I'd like to say that in uh, June spring 2016, the major part of the previous group retired. We were six at the time, and four out of the six retired. There was a need to, to recruit new colleagues, so three new colleagues were recruited during autumn 2016. At the end of 2017, beginning, to correction, 2016, beginning of 2017, a new prosecutor was introduced to this case, Christopher Peterson, and in February 2017, he was formally appointed as a new prosecutor. The group, the Palme Investigation Group, consists currently of uh, one head of investigations, two detective inspectors, and one civilian investigator. So a couple of words about how Stig Engström, how the investigation became interested in Stig Engström. The new group was to be introduced to the case, and I did what I normally do. Uh, and you should read the review commission, the inquiry from 1999. And, uh, after this, uh, we started to work on different leads, and we decided also to review the material which had to do partly with the scene of the crime, the incident, and the individuals who were present. And as a result of that, we arrived at a conclusion that there was a person who didn't match the rest of the pattern. There was a person who didn't fit in. His statements uh, couldn't be corroborated by the statements with the statements of the other witnesses. So we started to consider this during the summer of 2017. And during the autumn of 2017, we started to work actively with this issue. 
and uh, after a short while we presented this information to the prosecutor and we were instructed by prosecutor Patterson to continue to focus on this individual. Having said that, I would like to pass the word to Mr. Patterson. The assassination, there have been a lot of discussions about whether the person who believed to, who was involved in this, whether he acted by himself or whether this was part of a conspiracy. And we have spent a lot of time trying to map other groups, persons, and uh, events in the time prior to this nation to trying to find traces of a conspiracy. It should be noted there were a number of interesting persons, interesting groups, but we haven't been able to find any support for the conspiracy theory. But it couldn't be rejected completely. He was part of a larger conspiracy. Just like Hans mentioned initially, this small Palmer group uh, the Palmer group wasn't as small as it has been recently. A large number of uh, policemen was involved from the start. And as you normally do in large murder investigations, you work with different suspects, different individuals, different leads, and everything should be done more or less in parallel. Different theories were given different degrees of uh, importance, and therefore the validation of the witness statements were was done differently compared to how we would have done this today. Or maybe some of the statements of the people who uh, claimed that they were at the scene, their statements were not assessed at all. Um, it should be noted that this assassination took place uh, and a large number of people saw the entire course of events or parts of the course of the events and we have received very different statements from the witnesses but there is one comprehensive picture which was a comprehensive statement which we are, uh, which we believe is which comes from all the witnesses is that the uh, murderer ran westwards on the Tunnelgarten Street. The description of the assassin has uh, varied based uh, over time and also uh, between the statements of the different witnesses. Very few, if uh, anyone at least, saw the face and could provide a description of the face of the uh, assassin, but uh, some of the people have written comments on how the alleged perpetrator was uh, dressed. What has uh, made the investigation more difficult for us is that more than 34 years have passed since the uh, assassination and uh, people, a number of people are maybe no longer with us or maybe they're very old. Oral evidence which uh, it doesn't improve over time. This is something which should be served fresh and as Khan said, we hoped to to get uh, clear indications from the NFC, National Forensic Center, but the NFC says that based on today's technology, possibly it won't be possible to tie a weapon to the murder scene. So therefore, what we have to work with is more or less the same forensic evidence as the evidence which was secured at the time, at the time of the assassination. What uh, also did make uh, this investigation easier is the big involvement on the media and the big uh, influence of the media on the witnesses. There has been a lot of interest uh, at the time of the assassination. There were a large number of articles in newspapers. The witnesses were interviewed by the media. Photos of the witnesses were published and uh, their statements were uh, reported in the uh, newspapers. And we noticed that the statements given by the witnesses would vary a lot 
between the initial interviews and what has happened later once they have uh, read what the other people have said and once they've seen photos of the people at the scene. So this is something which made our investigation work more difficult. So when it comes to the conclusion with respect to the perpetrator, I've been, I have mentioned the standards of proof and the prosecutor is not a court. And it should be noted that the forensic evidence will not provide us with any assistance from the way it looks like. But it's the way it is. The forensic evidence is what we have here. So therefore, we have to assess what happened at the time based on the existing materials. So if we go specifically to the information given about the man on the run or the perpetrator, as we claim, it should be noted that several of the witnesses who were interviewed initially and also later, they mention a person who was wearing a longer jacket or a coat. And uh, this uh, came more or less from all the witnesses. This was a longer jacket. At least the jacket, the length of the jacket was below the waist. And this was a winter night. And then the information about whether this person was wearing a headgear, this information has varied between the witnesses. Some, some people said that he had bare heads. Some, some said that he had a knitted cap. Some said that he was wearing a cap. Some of the witnesses uh, have become very important to this investigation, but maybe uh, the atten attention paid to them wasn't as great as their statements uh, actually deemed. There was a Mr. Lars Jepsen who was at the Tunnelgarten Street, at the intersection of Tunnelgarten Street, Ludmachergarten. I'll go through his statement later, but unfortunately, the description of the person he sees running past him on Tunnelgarten Street is a bit vague. Uh, one thing he was sure of, though, and that is that the man who ran away, that he did, he was wearing a cap, in fact. Another witness, which was very interesting, is Yvonne Nieminen. She was at the top there on Brunkebeis Ridge on David Bargeris Gata, the street. She also talks about a person that she meets dressed in a longer uh, coat with a smaller bag as well. And I'll say more about Nieminen later because this is also central to the investigation. Now the now this person, Stig Engstrom, what he told the police, he said how he was dressed at the time when he made his observations. He said that he was wearing a knee-length dark coat, he was wearing a cap, he was wearing glasses, and he had a, a wrist bag, a wristlet, a small bag that he had around his wrist. He's 182 centimeters uh, in height, weighs just over 80 kilos, and was at the time 52 years old. And he uh, was often in the media. We saw here, for example, this is how he, he said he was dressed on the night of the assassination. So, what he tells us about how he was dressed does in fact correspond uh, uh, with many of the information, much of the information provided by the, the witnesses, the coat, the cap, and also the small wrist bag that Yvonne Niemannen mentioned. And when we've gone through the material, what is odd is the fact that none of the other witnesses who were on the scene of the crime have recognized Stig Engstrom at all, as having been there at all, on the scene of the crime. As I will go back and say later as well, he did, he did go back and say what he did on the scene of the crime and how he acted. But if he has been there, he's disappeared, he disappeared before he made any impression on any of the witnesses who were on the scene of the crime, because nobody has been able to give any information with regard to Stieg Engstrom. 
Now, if we look at the information that he has provided with regard to how he acted that night, it does in fact, or is consistent with we, how we believe the perpetrator, the assassin, has reacted or acted that evening. Now, Stieg Engström, he wasn't a focal point of the investigation, but we've looked at his background. And what we can see there is that he was used to using weapons. He uh, had been employed by the military, by the army. He was a member of a shooting club. And in where he lived, he was also a part of a circle which was very critical of the prime minister. People, <clears throat> I mean, his relatives and people who knew him described him as uh, having a very negative view with regard to Olof Palme and his politics. And that's what these circles uh, spoke of. And, and we also know that he had financial problems for um, a long period of time. And also something that increased in time was that he uh, had a problem with alcohol. And he was in fact, he received care for that as well, actually. Now, the weapon, the gun, has been discussed a lot. And Stieg Engström, as I said, did know how to handle a weapon with his military background <coughs> and also his membership of a shooting club. However, having said that, there's, we can't actually put a specific gun in his hands, as it were. But what we have been able to say is that somebody in his neighborhood uh, in media, they took, talked about the arms collector, the weapon collector. He had a room full of guns. He was a collector. And we have uh, retrieved at least one gun which corresponded to the caliber of that we suspect was used during the uh, crime. Unfortunately, we didn't receive a positive response from the NFC. And then we believe that he must have had a gun in his hands that evening, bearing in mind what happened. In different contexts, and not perhaps in detail, but in many words, he's told many people about his what he did that actual evening. And and according to them, he was working late. It was a Friday evening and he was working very hard. He was at his office all evening and he didn't go out at all. However, there is information in the investigation, security guards working in the Scandia building saying that he in fact left. He went out, he left the building during the evening. But what's unclear is we don't know exactly when he came back to the Scandia building. But he did leave between, and, and uh, he did come back between eight and nine in the evening. Now this isn't something he hasn't told the police about. He has always said and claimed that he was in, in his office the whole evening. The following day on the Saturday, according to the plan, was that he was going to go skiing with his wife and therefore he had to work late. He had to finish complete certain tasks at work. Now, according to the information that he provided, he closed his office door at a quarter past 11. So he was working on the first floor of the Scandia building. He walked down the stairs and he said a few words to the security guard in the reception and then left the building. Now, according to the technology that they had, that he had in fact a, a card that he used and you can see that that badge or pass was used at 23.20. Uh, unfortunately, the punch clock, uh, the clock there was wrong. Uh, it was in fact running fast, so it was, it was in fact 23.19 when he left. And so he left the Scandia building um, via Sibia Bergen no, number 44. Now, the assassination occurred at 23.21.30, roughly. Now, Stieg Engström told the police, and has always said, 
uh, even later, that he was going to take the underground to Murby Centrum. He was going to take the uh, underground from T Centralum in the center of town. And the last train towards Murby Centrum left at 2348. Now, in my view, he had therefore ample time to get to T Centralen and to take the underground towards Murby Centrum. But he said that he was in a hurry. He felt that he was in a hurry and that he, I mean, he had to get that train and he was um, in a hurry. And it's a bit unclear what happens actually when Stieg Engstrom uh, left Sveavig in 44. So either he does as he said he did, is that he goes left, turns left, goes southwards, walking towards the scene of the crime. Or he then was going to go in the other direction to Audenplan and take the night bus instead. That means that he would have met and seen uh, the couple and then decided to commit the crime. But now, 34 years later, we cannot ex establish more exactly the exact route that he took. However, that he saw the couple at some point on Sveavegen is something that we believe is true. And that he um, was carrying a gun, uh, this is also something that we've spoken about uh, as well, and we don't, can't say more about that. Uh, as I said, he was in a hurry, and he therefore wanted to see how much time he had to get to Tiersentralen. And he has said very clearly that he had a, a watch with a black face, and that's how he described it. And with the black face, it was very difficult to see in the dark that evening. So that's why he sort of uh, walked towards the building itself on Sveabergen. Uh, there was a shop window and there he could see what the time was. And he was so concentrated on this that he didn't notice uh, the prime minister and his wife who were walking. I mean, they were walking along Sveabergen and nor did he see that they were shot. He didn't hear the shots, he didn't see anything, he didn't see that they were shot at. And according to what he has said, it was only when he almost stumbled on Olaf Palmer, who was lying on the ground, that something, he, that's, it was only then that he realised that something had happened. He didn't become aware of the fact that he was shot. Immediately he thought that it was something else. But it was only then that he noticed and realized that something had happened there on the street. And he also says, or said that he, that one of the first people to, or that he was one of the first to, to be on the scene and to give him first aid. Uh, there were other people who, in fact, who were there first, who were going to give, who were going to give first aid. And they, and this does not, in fact, is not consistent with what we've been able to establish with regard to the witness in question. Now, he also mentions something very interesting, and that was when he arrived at the scene, he then looked uh, eastwards along Tunnel Garth down the street, and there he says that he saw a person standing in an intersection with Lund Magagatan, the building there. And what he saw was a, a man who he thought was in his 20s wearing a dark blue jacket. Uh, and he saw him just for a couple of seconds before he disappeared. I, this man on Lund Makagatan. And Stieg Engström says that he spoke to Mrs. Palmer and this is varied a bit, actually, what he said. We don't quite know uh, what he said, whether he made, whether he saw the man in the jacket before he spoke to her or after. But he says that he spoke to uh, Mrs. Palmer on the scene and also that she gave him a description of the perpetrator. 
and the description that she gave him was that the perpetrator was wearing a quilted jacket, a blue jacket. And as far as we know, and we've really been through this very carefully, Mrs. Palmer has never said anything about her speaking to a civilian, i.e. somebody who wasn't a police officer, on the scene of the crime, and has absolutely not left a description of the perpetrator, uh, that she has spoken to people, uh, etc. That was that she wanted people to help her with her, her husband who had been shot. Now, when the police arrived on the scene after a couple of minutes, Stieg Engström said that he stopped giving first aid and uh, instead he stood up and showed the police uh, where he, the perpetrator or suspect, suspect disappeared. And he pointed towards Tunnelgatan and said to the police, that that is where the man ran towards. And here we've also tried to look at this and, and see whether there is anybody who has acted in this way on the scene next to Olaf Palmer. No police officer has been able to confirm this at all. M moreover, there are other witnesses who have said that they have separately told the police about where the man ran and they were not Stieg Engström. These were different witnesses. Now Stieg Engström himself says that he told them the direction which the perpetrator had taken to the police, but he forgot to tell the police uh, about the description of the perpetrator, he says. I mean, the police need to know who they're running after. They're going to run after somebody, which is why Stig Engström then decided himself to run after the police officers and to tell them and to give them a description of the suspect. Now, he was an athlete in his youth, so he was quite a fast runner, as I will show you. But despite this, in the meters to the intersection with Lundmakagatan, I mean, we're not talking about a very long distance there, the police officers have disappeared and Sieg Engström can't see the policemen at all. So they are they have basically disappeared. And there we know in fact that the police did get to the steps that go that take you to David Bagas Gata and they also checked the lift that was there. There's also an escalator that they looked at, but Sieg Engström didn't see this according to his own words. And he says that he returned then to the scene of the crime. Nobody has seen him go back to the scene of the crime. And one explanation for that, that he has given to the police, was that he didn't take the same route back to the scene when he was running after the police. No, in fact, he went the other way round the builder's hut at the southern end or, or the southern side of Tunnel Gatam. The road. So nobody saw him return to the scene either <clears throat> and none of the police officers who come back after having run after the, uh, the suspect. And Engstrom then says that he wanted to report to the police what he has seen. So the police were busy speaking to other witnesses at the scene and Engstrom then hears a witness talking to the police and the witness then was giving a description which corresponded to how he was dressed with a cap, with the glasses and the longer dark coat. And Engstrom wanted to correct this information because he felt that it was unnecessary that the police were going to be given erroneous information with regard to description. Instead, he was going to give the description that he'd been given by Lisbeth Palmer. But uh, the police officer was not interested in seeing Engstrom's information. Engstrom said that the police officer said they already had a witness. Therefore, his Stig Engstrom statement, which he wanted to give, wasn't taken. Even though it was uh, chaos at the scene, we can 
established that none of the people, none of the police officers, none of the witnesses, no one else have mentioned that they have seen Stig Enström approach any of the police officers after the assassination. And he was definitely not acting in the manner he claimed to have acted. According to information given by himself, Stig Enström stayed at the scene for a while and then he went back to Skande and we know from the security guards who were working at Skande that he returned at 11.40, uh, 11.43 p.m. and he's quite shook up. He enters the Skande building and he calls, his, he calls his wife. According to his statement, he had a cup of coffee he had plenty of time now, that's what he claimed, and he walked to Autumnplan and took the night bus uh, to, his, uh, to the area where he lived. So the question we have asked ourselves, what did Stig Engstrom do for about 20 minutes, around 20 minutes, without anyone seeing him? Is it just a person who wanted to end up in the spotlight and just wanted to give a statement making him more important than, than he actually was? Or is there any other, are there any other explanations? As far as we could, we could have noted and we have analyzed this thoroughly, none of the witnesses, in our opinion, have said anything about Stig Engstrom or his actions during the entire course of events. And additionally, I'd like to come back to the way he was dressed, as he stated himself, with the long coat, the cap, the wrist bag, and the glasses. If you look at the other witnesses around the crime scene, I will not uh, present each uh, of the witnesses individually, but those of the witnesses who have provided a description of a perpetrator, they have been quite clear when it comes to certain elements of uh, the clothing. They talk about a dark, coat-like garment uh, to the knees. Uh, uh, Anders B says that he had a dark knitted hat. Anna Hage, who admitted first aid uh, to uh, the Prime Minister, said that he was middle-aged, uh, three-fourth length coat, probably no hat. Jan Oke says uh, three-quarters length uh, dark jacket, dark hair, or dark knitted hat. Anders D. Uh, long coat down to the knees, grayish with black elements and headgear. Uh, someone else mentions a dark or dark blue knitted uh, cap and a dark coat-like garment uh, reaching down to the knees. A dark uh, long coat to the knees, dark coat to the knees, not certain about the headgear. One is certain that there was no headgear, but this, there was an overcoat which didn't quite reach to the down to the knees. Long, uh, dark, long, loosely hanging coat. Inge Morelos, dark coat, longer than the jacket, dark uh, hat. Half long coat, dark. The witness couldn't say where this was a man or a woman, she observed. Uh, dark hair, dark uh, trousers, dark jacket, something dark on the head. What I'm saying is that if you read and analyze the statement of the witnesses, a lot of this indicates that the person who was running away, who should have been the perpetrator, the reasons to believe that this was a man dressed in a coat and this was a man dressed in a dark coat. Lars Jepson, the witness, was uh, of particular importance to the investigation. He is a central uh, character in the investigation. Earlier during the same night, he was uh, at an establishment to, to, to listen to music, and then he walked along Lundmarker Gotham Street, which is uh, the street parallel to Svea Wegen, and he came to the intersection of Tunnel Gotham Street. He was thinking whether he would uh, attend a nightly 
uh, a night open, a cinema opened at night, and he was along a builder's hut, which was uh, there at Tunnelgarten. So he couldn't see immediately what was happening at the crime scene, but he heard a noise, which he was difficult to place. And he turned around and had a look and saw how a person uh, was falling to the ground and my claim that this person was the prime minister. Soon afterwards, uh, Lars Jepson heard steps approaching on Tunnelgarten. Someone ran by him on Tunnelgarten Street in the direction of the steps, which are at the end of Tunnelgarten. Uh, Lars Jepson is still hidden alongside the builder's hut. So he was at if you look at this sketch, there is a builder's hut indicated, so he was hiding by the edge of the hut, and he saw the man running by along to the garden, and the man disappeared up the steps in the direction of the David Bogget has got the street. When he is about to leave and see where the running man uh, disappeared, he went to the spot marked uh, with, uh, highlighted in red. This is the intersection of Lundmark and Gotham, Tunnel Gotham, and he looked for the uh, man. Everything indicates that Lars Jepson saw the murderer running. Therefore, his uh, information about the description is very important, but unfortunately, Jepson, Lars Jepson wasn't able to make any good observation of this running person, but there was one thing he noticed, and this is something he, ma he maintained and he took for certain, is that the, the running man was wearing a cap. And uh, according to his own statements, Dick Engstrom was also wearing a cap during on the night in question. And once this running man who ran by uh, Lars Jepson and uh, came a bit up the steps, and this I claim that this is Stig Engstrom. Only then, yep, uh, Lars Jepson dared to have a look. He went to the intersection of Tunnel Gotham, Lundmark Gotham. Jepson was uh, looking for the person running away, and he noted that the man who was running away when he came to the top of the stairs at Tunnel Gotham, he turned around and looked down and uh, noticed Lars Jepson. We claim that it was possible for him to see Lars Jepson. Jepson became afraid that he was noticed uh, by the perpetrator or by the man running away. So he ran back or quickly moved to the builder's hut in order not to be exposed to the uh, man who was running away. It's unclear how long time it took for him to consider his next move, but since but later, Lars Jepson started to pursue the running man. He started to run up the steps. If we go back to Stig Engstrom's statement to the police and his statements he has made in other contexts. He said that he made an observation of a man in the intersection of Tunnelgarten, Lundmarker Garten, a man dressed in a blue quilted um, jacket. Based on the description he provided during the police interview, uh, we could be certain that he saw uh, Jepson and that he described Jepson and he identified Jepson when photos of uh, Jepson were shown to him by the police. And he described when he made this observation, namely soon after he arrived at the crime scene, he almost stripped over the uh, prime minister, but there were two younger people who were administering first aid to the prime minister when uh, uh, Stig Engstrom arrived and he said that he talked to Lisbeth Palmer and she provided him with a description of a man dressed in a blue quilted coat. So according to Engstrom's information, he made these observations of Lars Jepson quite early during the uh, chain of the events. But 
if the information given by Eggstrom is correct, then by that time there must have been cars at the scene. The cars which dropped off the two younger people who were administering first aid, and these cars were parked on the Sverwegen Road. And this is an important piece of informa information, in my opinion. Like we've mentioned earlier, Elizabeth Parliament never mentioned that she talked to any civilian, and no one else has seen him at the crime scene. But if Engstrom's information is correct, that he saw this person at the intersection, then he must have been positioned somewhere. We've uh, uh, shown a sketch uh, earlier, but he must be somewhere along the yellow line, which you can see on this sketch. And we could imagine if uh, Engstrom wanted to make himself more important than he actually was at the time, that he was on the western side of the of Sveavegin Road, so on the other side of Sveavegin, making these observations. And therefore, this piece of information is not credible, or even probable, because according to his own statement, a lot of people must have approached by the time cars were parked on Sveavegin, which would block his view along the Tunnelgatan Street. If he was standing at the crime scene and he would make the observations of Jepson, then based on common logic, he should have been seen, he should have been discovered by someone, but no one saw him at the crime scene acting the way he said he acted. So the only reasonable explanation, uh, explanation to the, of the fact that he saw Lars Jepson is that he was standing at the top of the steps he looked down and he saw Lars Jepsen at the intersection before Lars Jepsen heads behind the builder's hut once again. Uh, the, another question you could ask yourself, Lars Jepsen's information shouldn't be he a person of interest, a suspected perpetrator. And uh, he was interviewed on several occasions by the Police and a couple of interviews were quite tough. It was difficult for the police to believe his uh, story, but he stuck to his statement. And in my opinion, there are no reasons to believe that he was lying during the police interviews. Another, uh, maybe more important uh, issue is his height. He's 164 centimeters, uh, Lars Jepsen. And this doesn't correspond to the description of the perpetrator by the witnesses and the aged parties who were supposed to be longer than uh, the prime minister who was taller than 170 centimeters. So in our opinion, Lars Jepsen is a witness who was at the scene, but he doesn't match the description of a perpetrator. <laughs> Now, when Jepson, according to his own story, ran after the man fleeing the scene of the crime, and when he had almost sort of got to the top of the stairs, he met a woman called Yvonne Niemenen. She's out walking with a male companion. And she said that just before that, she'd seen a man running along David Bagares Gata, and Jepson then continued in that direction, hoping to catch up with the man who was running away, but couldn't see him and therefore stopped following him. He then tried to get in touch with the police and so therefore walked towards back towards the scene of the crime. Yvonne Niemenen has provided very interesting information, but has unfortunately been very badly um, handled actually I must say uh, by the investigation she wasn't heard in the uh, court either for the defense or for the prosecutor in fact now she had been to uh, an establishment on Johannes Gartan together with her friend and was on the, they, were, they were on their way home and as they turned into David Bargaris Gartan she observed a man running on the other side of the road on the pavement and 
we have to remember him. I mean, Yvonne Nieminen hadn't heard any shots at all. So she didn't know that anything had happened, but she made this observation, which she was able to tell the police in interview. And in her interview, she says this is very soon after the assassination, on the 2nd of March, she said that she met a man who was running along David Bagas Gata, and that this man had a small bag, uh, 20 uh, by uh, 15 centimeters in size, and he was trying to open or shut. And she reacted to the fact that he didn't stop and do what he was doing, but he was doing it whilst he was running. She says that he was wearing a dark coat, which sort of went part down the, down the leg. It was open, unbuttoned, and was flapping in the wind. And it also looked as if he had, a, he had trouble running because it was slippery, there was a lot of slush, and he wasn't wearing good uh, shoes, uh, so he was slipping, basically. And she meant that the person who ran past her uh, was about 30, 40 years old, and 174 to 178 centimeters in height. And this is something that she tells the police on the 2nd of March. So after midnight on the night of the assassination. So the question you can put there is who was dressed in a dark coat? Who had a smaller bag with them and came from an office job? And what I mean by that is that you perhaps don't have heavy boots on when you're working in an office. You might have uh, lighter shoes, which would explain somebody slipping on a slushy pavement. And that person is, of course, Stieg Engstrom. And after the observations made by Yvonne Niemann, there's nobody else who's seen Stieg Engström until he gets back, goes back to the Scandia building at about 23.40. Now, the day after the murder, uh, he also acted in a rather peculiar way, to my mind. I mean, he was working late that night was because he and his wife were going on a skiing holiday on a Saturday and instead of packing or preparing for their ski trip, he was looking for information. He called his employer. He wanted information about when he had uh, left his the office, um, when he had punched out, clocked out. And Ingstrom wanted to receive uh, that information from Scandia when he left the building. And the reason he gave uh, to why this was so important was that the police, the, the media and Norway were chasing him, he said. Now, what's odd there is that at that point in time, nobody knew anything about Stieg Engström. He hadn't uh, provided any information to the police at that stage and the media didn't have his name uh, before he himself uh, got in touch with the police and the media. What we do know is that on the television there were extra news broadcasts in the middle of the day, at noon in fact, and in that extra news broadcast, after about eight minutes, there was a description of the perpetrator that was given. A person aged 30, 35, 170, 180 centimetres in height, dark clothes and also perhaps possibly wearing a cap, they said in the news broadcast. Now this then uh, made, I mean, Engstrom, before he received the time of his, his clocking out of the building, he then called the police at 12.20 on that Saturday and told the police what he'd done in, that evening and he, that the description 
that was given in the news uh, broadcast was possibly he himself. And he tells the police officer that there's this man in the blue jacket, i.e. Jepson, and also he says that Mrs. Palmer also mentioned the man in the blue jacket. He didn't mention everything or everything that he had with him. He didn't doesn't say anything about the wristlet that he was that he had with him, that he was carrying on him at that time. After having uh, been in touch with the police, Engstrom doesn't prepare for his ski trip. Instead, he calls Svenska Dagbladet, the broadsheet newspaper, and he there he they come home to Engstrom, in fact, the reporters, and they take photographs of him at the kitchen table. They write a newspaper article about his observations on the night of the assassination. And this photograph article are published on Sunday, the 2nd of March. Now, if we, if you, somebody who are cynical, or if you like conspiracies, then of course, this is a smart thing to sort of say that here I am, show the information so that, you know, if you're pointed at later on in the investigation, you can always say that, well, you, there's been media coverage of you and that that's why people point at you. Now we've looked at this in detail, but Engstrom did leave on his ski trip on the Sunday, on the 2nd of March, and we haven't found any traces or anything that we can't see that he has take, been in touch with the police or the media but the newspapers were of course full of information about the assassination and amongst other things this this bag this small bag is mentioned that Yvonne Nieman mentioned and also the man running at, on the uh, Brunke Bay Ridge at the top of the stairs and Lars Jepson how he was dress that's also described and different witnesses are quoted and how police cars how they arrived on the scene in which order and what measures they took not the police cars obviously but the police officers in the police cars when Stieg Engström then came home after his ski trip there was a second interview with him and this was well, the first interview was when he called himself. It was the se the second one was also a telephone interview, and at that time he was able to describe the type of police cars that arrived and when they arrived on the scene, and he also mentioned to the police that he had a dark brown wrist bag with him. And so this new statement uh, was slightly different to his first. Um, so and then the following day a longer interview was conducted with him we don't know whether it was via telephone or at the police uh, but anyway he gives the same statement there are no follow-up questions they don't call into question the information that he uh, provides the police so the police had a lot to do at the beginning of this investigation and they decided to uh, perform a witness reconstruction with a number of witnesses who had been on the scene of the crime and this was in fact conducted on the weekend of the 5th of April. Now why, and we've tried to understand this, but we don't know why, but Stig Engstrom wasn't uh, invited to participate and the reason for this we haven't been able to find, but we can just say that Stig Engstrom was not one of the witnesses uh, who was allowed to participate and to say what they had done uh, to the police. He used to, he had previously worked at Swedish Radio and had friends there and they then um, gave him a contact to uh, Japot, the, the, um, the news programme, um, where they made their own reconstruction which was recorded and then broadcast on the news. Ligger på Sveavägen, 50 meter från en plats. 
Gambia is 50 meters from where Olaf Palma was assassinated. At 20 past 11 on the 28th of February, Stig Engstrom left his the office building to get the last tube home. He was in a hurry and he checked his watch uh, to see whether he would get to the tube at time. At the same time, he had two shots. However, he wasn't able to get hold of the police and then returned to the scene of the crime. You may have seen Stieg Engstrom on the site, the scene of the crime, and you may have thought he was the perpetrator. Well, no, I mean, at that time, we didn't know that it was Olof Palme, so there wasn't much interest in this at that time. So I think that they were quite happy with uh, the witnesses that they already had. They weren't interested. No, no. Despite the fact that you wanted to say that you had been described as the assassin just a moment before, well, they said it wasn't interesting. They were very uninterested actually, until the ambulance arrived just after and we found out who it was. And the following day, he read about the assassination in the newspapers and thought that he was being described there. And because this was because the description of the perpetrator was consistent with what, what he was wearing, the, the, the coat, the cap, the glasses. And he called the police to once again say that, that they was, there was a mix up, but no, to no avail. Well, they said that it was interesting, but presumably they didn't have time really to do anything about it at that time because there were so many people who were calling them. And today there's several reconstructions have been performed. Entire blocks were um, closed off and all the witnesses from the night of the assassination were called, but Sieg Engstrom, who was the first on site, wasn't asked to participate. And he thinks that he could help the police because he is and works with advertising and is therefore very observant. Well, when you say that you're sort of trying to put jigsaw, a jigsaw puzzle together and trying to put pieces into this jigsaw puzzle, then of course you shouldn't, you know, take away uh, pieces of the jigsaw that you know belong to the the jigsaw puzzle. But perhaps they're not very good at at um, uh, putting jigsaw puzzles together. The police. So my interpretation of this is that he's mocking the police in their work when he makes this statement. And you can note that the in the Palmer room, the investigation, there's thing Engstrom is in fact discussed on a number of occasions. On the 20th of April, for example, in 1986, they did discuss Sting Engstrom as a possible perpetrator. However, this was at a low level, as it were, and no special measures were taken. And another interview was conducted on the 25th of April with Stig Engstrom, uh, where Stig Engstrom can just, is just allowed to uh, make his statement. He looks at photographs of people who were on the scene of the crime and there was also information that uh, Stig Engstrom knew Lars uh, Jepson and so there was a short telephone interview on the 25th of May to uh, look into that and as far as we can see that is the what how, with, with regard to interviews etc with Engstrom that's all that we can see The investigation continued and uh, during the autumn and early winter of uh, 86 and early winter 87, the police prepared Operation Alpha, what Hans Melander told about, the raid against the PKK and the Kurds, and this was the main theory which the investigation group was working on, and this was PKK. And in order to, to, to work on this theory, uh, further there were, to put it diplomatically, there were differences of opinion between the prosecutors and the 
police about how many people would be arrested and if people would be arrested or asked to come into or taken for the interviews and uh, there were uh, conclusions may prove that this was the right theory and uh, you didn't want to get any distractions on the 12th of November, very strange statement was made in the so-called Palme Room. Holmer said that they want to run the Engstrom track to the ground before, quote unquote, the prosecutor pounces. They don't want to have any new fights, any new struggle. They had to fight a lot about the raid on PKK, and they didn't want Engstrom to impede his future plans. But this is when they discussed that they have to get to, to, to bring it to the end, the signature. And how to bring this to the end? Well, uh, further discussions were held in the Palmer Room, and at least one of the persons there on the 8th of January 1987 said that it must be Stig Enstrom who was seen by von Yemenen at the top of the stairs. He didn't get, he didn't have any other explanation, and he decided that this was worth investigating further. And the decision was made to do something. The problem was that that he was not invited to this reconstruction, crime scene reconstruction. So there were no police photos of uh, Stig Engstrom. They had to go to the tabloids to find uh, photos of Stig Engstrom when he was photographed by the different newspapers. One of the photos was taken to present uh, to Yvonne Niemenem. Certain measures which didn't directly involve segregation, but certain measures were taken in January and February 1987, and this resulted in a memo dated February the 9th. And this memo, to me, is uh, the, decide, the most decisive document in this uh, uh, investigation. This is a remarkable memo, and the result of this memo that the interest from the police to uh, Engstrom completely died out, and the matter was closed, and nothing else was done with Stig Engstrom. The background uh, to this memo is that on the 30th of January 1987, Yvonne Yemenen was uh, presented with a photo of Stig Engstrom from the newspaper, and she was asked to, to, with respect to the statement she gave on the 2nd of March, 1986. And additionally, some people were interviewed at the Orland Islands who were suspected to have some information which were irrelevant with respect to Stig Engstrom. But no interview was done with Stig Engstrom. No interviews were planned with Stig Engstrom. This memo was uh, issued. And this, since I consider this to be a uh, central uh, document. I would like to present this extensively during this press conference. This is a document dated February the 9th, and they say that Yvonne Yemenin was shown photos, and she was shown presented with a photo of Engstrom. They say that they interviewed these people at the Orland Islands. They say something about what Engstrom has said earlier during the course of the investigation, that he was uh, shown a number of photos when he was interviewed on the 25th of April, 1986. And at the time, he identified Lars Jepson, Helena Lerde, Karin Johansson and Anders Björkman. Uh, they also mentioned that another witness, Jan Andersson, uh, reacted to the photo of Engstrom and he could describe how Engstrom acted at the scene. I will come back to what those people actually said, but the conclusions made in this memo is that uh, based on the information above, but on the fact that Engstrom could identify these uh, people, this means that he was at the scene in accordance with his own statement. 
which he made during earlier into, and here they establish that Engstrom was at the crime scene, although if you look closer at the documents, he wasn't seen by anyone else. When it comes to Ivan Nieminen, it becomes even more difficult to understand what they mean by this memo, because they say it's probably that Ivan Nieminen did not meet, did not see Stig Engstrom at David Bogger's Gotha Street. They say it's unclear how, oh, what the perpetrator looked like. There were different descriptions about how he was dressed. And they emphasized specifically that the witnesses, Anders Bjorkman and Inge Morelius, who uh, were the witnesses at the scene, they gave different statements about uh, how the perpetrator was dressed. And I will come back to that because, in my opinion, they uh, gave quite similar statements about how the perpetrator was dressed. But the conclusion of the memo, it's doubtful that she saw the perpetrator and the person she saw is probably not Stig Engström. This was a person who was dressed in the same manner as Engstrom, and this is the person she saw, which means that a person who looks like Engstrom, who moves like Engstrom, and uh, who is described by Yvonne Nieminen is uh, deemed to be a, another person who is not Engstrom, but no one else has been able to provide any information about him. If you look at the interview with Yvonne Nieminen when she was interviewed uh, about her initial statements in March, and this is a so-called interview with, where the photos were where she was presented with photos. She believes that the uh, photo looks similar, his build, his uh, coat, the little bag he was carrying seems to uh, to correspond to what I remember she, it's, she doesn't believe that the coat is completely right. It seems to be thicker than compared to the recollections of the coach she saw on the man who was running along David Barger's Carter. The shoes seem to be right. Uh, and this is the photo from the newspapers which were, she was presented with. He was uh, wearing, he was not wearing winter boots, he was wearing regular shoes which would make him uh, slip. However, she believes that he seems to be too short. She, her assessment is that the man on the photo is about 180 centimeters tall. And, and according to her opinion, the perpetrator was about 185 centimeters. Uh, it should be noted that during the first interview, uh, when she talked about the height of the perpetrator was 174 to 178, and Stig Engstrom was 180 centimeters uh, uh, tall. So she uh, strengthens or she expands on her information about the person she saw, uh, which is described in the interview from the 2nd of March. The other witnesses who saw the shooting, and this is Anders Bjerk Bjerkman and Inge Marinus, and the claim in the memo was said that they have given different information about how the perpetrator was dressed. Bjerkman was interviewed on three occasions soon after the assassination, and he talks about a longer, longer coat. This is interview number one. In the interview number two, he has certain tells he's not certain whether the prime minister was dressed in a dark coat, but in the interview number three, he said that the perpetrator was wearing a longer coat. Inge Morelius, who was sitting in a car on Sveavegen, and he made his observation. He talked about a longer garment. He described it as a parka, but not a, as, as a jacket, as a parka, something which is slightly longer. And this is something he described during three uh, different interviews. And the witness which uh, made observations of Stig Engstrom in the memory records in the, on the 
crime scene, according to the memo. This is a gentleman called Jan Andersson, who allegedly gave the information that it was he saw Stig Engström. And if you look at Jan Andersson's uh, statement during the police, if you you could ask yourself a question whether he describes Engström. The the person he describes in the interview, it's a person who has a who is who seems to wear a suit or something similar to a suit under his uh, outer garment and uh, it's a greyish poplin coat and acted quite actively at the crime scene. If you look at the photo which was shown during the uh, to the witness, there was another person, Janke Svensson, who was wearing a grey poplin coat and he said that he was acting at the scene and he talked to Jan Andersson who was sitting in a car. So according to our opinion, Jan Andersson identified Jan Orke Svensson during his interview. To emphasize the conclusions in the memo, they uh, pay attention to the fact that during the interview on the 25th of April, Stig Engström identified people who were at the crime scene. At least one of them, Helena Lade, was not at the crime scene, but she was withdrawing money from a cash machine on the other side of Sveavägen. And therefore, this memo, which I would call a remarkable document, it contains conclusions which we don't, we don't comprehend how they arrived at these conclusions, that another person clad, dressed in the same manner as Stig Enstrom, but who wasn't Stig Enstrom, and this was the person observed by the witness Nieminen, and based uh, on that, we have given the uh, statements from the other witnesses, and the statements reflected in the memo are not the ones they gave during the uh, police interviews, but this leads to certain uh, activities, uh, and uh, only three uh, days later, on the 12th of February, Stig Engström was dismissed from the investigation as a person who was present at the scene. He was there, they don't know what he was doing there, but he is no longer a person of interest. And then uh, his, uh, his uh, part in the case is closed. Be other people uh, become more interesting to the investigator. Hans Holmer resigned in f March 1987. But the interest of the police to Stig Enstrom uh, completely died out. No further attempts were made to contact Stig Enstrom. No further attempts by the police. He was examined as a witness during the Christa Patterson trial, both in the district court and the court of appeal. He was called by the defense because he claimed that Elizabeth Palmer said they shot me as well, that there were several per perpetrators involved. And he gave similar, or he provided uh, information about his actions on the crime scene, which uh, slightly changed compared to what he has said previously. He gave interviews to the media. He continues to be a person of interest to the, this is the beginning of the 90s. He gave an interview to a newspaper, Proletarian, in 1991 and uh, another uh, magazine, which is, which is uh, for the security industry called Hood and Secret in 1992. And this article, he describes a scenario where this is not an issue of a murder, but rather the question of a manslaughter and uh, that the perpetrator was insulted by the prime minister, uh, after which the perpetrator lost his temper and committed, but he didn't uh, admit or didn't confess to any criminal acts, but he talks about what could have motivated the uh, perpetrator. Sting Engstrom passed away in the year 2000. He wasn't uh, interviewed again as part of this investigation. And therefore, we haven't been able to, to conduct any investigative measures with him. Some, yeah. Whether, I mean, with regard to whether there was either on his own or as part of a conspiracy, we don't see that as probable a conspiracy, bearing in mind that he has been in the media a lot 
and perhaps it's it was good that he was able to show up what he was wearing his this you know as it were the description of him in his first interview but but as if uh, for a conspiracy theory of course that would not uh, be the case so therefore he would be a lone assassin in that case and i have drawn certain conclusions with regard to this and i would say that there are several rather difficult or uh, circumstances which are difficult to explain with regard to Stieg Engström and had the current Palme investigation group uh, participated already 34 years ago I think that Stieg Engström would have been detained if he hadn't been able to leave satisfactory explanations uh, with regard to these uh, explanations that he gives and my view is that there is sufficient circumstances which would have led to him being remanded in custody. I'm not saying that this alone is sufficient. I'm not that stupid, but uh, saying that there's that we have evidence for the crime, but it would have given us a reasonable chance to work with the case and also to find evidence against him. For example, find a possible weapon, uh, to uh, carry out a search in his home, in his office, technically look at his clothing as well, and also look at other circumstances, background, etc. Uh, but we can't do that. He has deceased and time has passed. However, I believe that we can't disregard these peculiar circumstances, and therefore we can see that Stieg Engstrom is a possible perpetrator. Even if we were to continue investigating this for years, we would still arrive at the conclusion that we see Stieg Engstrom as a suspect in this case. It is difficult and not really very probable that we, after 34 years, can get any further, uh, take any measures really which would give us more. And with that in mind, I believe, therefore, that the only decision that I can make at this stage, and that is to discontinue continue the investigation uh, because the suspect is deceased. And that was what I wanted to say here. Thank you, Krista Peterson and Hans Melando. Now we are going to go to the question and answer session where we have journalists with us following this via the link. And there are many of you who want to ask questions, which is why we want you to be as brief as possible. So it's one question per person. So let's start with TT. Who do you want to put the question to? I want to put a question to Prosecutor Krista Peterson. These are very serious uh, things that you're saying against a person who is not able to defend themselves at all. And you're doing that despite the fact that there's no weapon, there's no explanation as to how how he could have got hold of a weapon, and there will be no uh, court proceedings either. And prosecutors have, I mean, got it wrong before. Uh, so why should we believe you, you know, what you present to us today? Well, I've tried to explain what lies behind our reasoning and that's been sufficient for us to feel that and secure the why we're presenting this and and whether that convinces you or somebody else of course that is good but that is not what we have we, the, I aim as it were I mean we feel safe and secure in the conclusions that we have drawn thank you TT next we have Doggins New Hieta, the newspaper. Question from Doggins New Hieta to Krista Peterson. Have you been in touch with the national prosecutor uh, bearing, I mean, with regard to the perpetrator? I mean, do you agree with um, pointing out him as a perpetrator and also discontinuing the investigation? Well, in Sweden, uh, we as civil servants, we have, we are fairly independent. I have naturally, uh, I have perhaps not consulted with him, but I have in fact presented my conclusions 
uh, but I am responsible for the, for this uh, as the uh, as leading the investigation. Thank you to DM, and now we go over to Sweden Television, Swedish Television (SVT) for the next question. Yes, M my question is to Hans Melande. There have been so many witness interviews with uh, re regard to Stig Engström. There's been topsy for DNA, etc. DNA tests taken. Uh, what how conclusions have you been able to draw there? Well, yes, we've taken DNA swabs, um, and that is because we wanted to try for different reasons to find a DNA which was as close to Engstrom as possible. Oh, for for what reason? Well, there are parts of the investigation which where we have not been able to link these to a specific person, but which might be interesting from a per perpetrator perspective. So we wanted to test his DNA and compared, compare it with those objects. Thank you then to SVT. And next we have TV4 is the next person to put a question. TV4, are you with us? Ah, there you are. Yes, we're back. Thank you. Yes, I apologize. Krista Peterson, is it really reasonable to discontinue the investigation without the gun, without the DNA, with no good witness statements? Will the general public accept this? Well, as Hans Melanda has already said, we have in fact uh, turned to the National Forensic Center and they have explained that they would not be able to, I mean, even if we did have the right gun and the right bullets, we might not be able to link the two to and to the crime scene, uh, which is why the witness statements are very important to us. And as I said, we, we are uh, sure of the conclusions that we've drawn with regard to the information in there. And the technical investigations, it can't help us at this stage, which is why you have to look at other information instead. Thank you. Next then is uh, Swedish Radio. Yes, hello. Um, Krista Peterson, how have you, I mean, have you investigated whether there's been any accomplice at all? Well, what I can say there is that what we have done uh, with the help of SEP or the security police, we work closely with them. And we've also interviewed a number of people who have been part of these circles and organizations that existed at that point in time. And they, there's, of course, uh, the this aspect of confidentiality about people who've been participating or who participate in these groups. And we really try to map out these people, find any contacts with Stieg Enstrom, but we haven't found anything really that points at that being point, part of such a group or participated in such an organization or group. Thank you. And next we have uh, Aftonbladet newspaper. Yes, a question to Krista Peterson. You've said earlier to the SVT that we're going to solve this. And in February, you said that there is technical proof and evidence. Do you believe that this murder has been um, resolved? And what's the technical evidence that you were pointing at in February? Well, as Han said, we have, we discussed this uh, the matter of DNA, where we hoped that that would give us information. But we've come as far as we have been able to come when it comes to a suspect. And this is our solution in that we can't get, get come further than this. There, 
so what I'm saying is that this is something that probably would have been uh, taken to court as a prosecutor. We can, can't can get any further than this. This is what we're presenting here and now. Uh, next we have Swedish Svenska Dagbladet, the newspaper. Yes, Jonas Gummerson here. Now, my question is, this whole presentation basically rests on old material and as far as I've understood this, very little new uh, is included here. You have looked at witness statements, you've gone back to the crime scene, etc. How, I mean, what's your view with regard to that and how sure are you, how certain, I mean, you're pointing at a, at a certain person, Sieg Engström, as a perpetrator, how sure are you of you? Well, this is an old case, it's 34 years old, and the people who made statements, they did that around the time of the crime, and that is something that we have to deal with. It would, of course, have been good to present technical evidence that was more recent, which would support us further with regard to the suspect, but we've made the assessment regarding the information received from the NFC, we can't move along, we can't make any more progress. And so we have to make an assessment here at this stage and this is what we have to deal with. Next, we have Expressen, the newspaper Expressen. Yes, good morning. Uh, now, what about this weapon collector? You mentioned him earlier that there were uh, guns that had been test fired. Could you say a little bit more about that, about what the results of that? Uh, do you think that, I mean, it was, you didn't receive a positive result, but could, do you think it might be uh, um, the gun and the DNA? Was that linked to that? Now, without going into too much detail, detail about that person, we did take a weapon from that collection of the same caliber and the NFC, when they analyze this, they have a scale from plus four to minus four when regarding the probability, how it, whether it corresponds or not. And in the middle, there is a zero. So you can't say either yes or no, for or against. And Hans, the response from NFC for, was that it was in fact zero, you couldn't say plus or minus. And in this context, that is a, quote, better result, unquote, than you've had to testify a gun and that it was on minus, or well, minus, but having said that, now that we have, during the spring, what we have received the statement from the NS NFC and their view is that the bullet and the gun are very difficult to link at this stage, uh, so we can't make progress there. And therefore, in all probability, it will be impossible to I make any form of identification by the NFC. And that's something that we as the investigators have had to deal with. Thank you. Let's move on then to Swedish Radio and Radio Stockholm. Let's see if P4 Radio Stockholm is still with us. Doesn't seem to be the case. Moving on to uh, GP from Gothenburg. Yes. When and in which context did you actually feel that you can find a solution and you can present the solution you presented here today? From my, for me personally, this was, you cannot really say that, that there was one 
isolated issue, but just like Hans said, once we reviewed the materials, once we got an understanding of what people have said at the uh, crime scene, then this memo, uh, for me at least, my opinion is that a woman identifies Stig Engstrom in quite a, uh, quite properly, but it wasn't used by the police. It just resulted in a decision to remove him from the investigation. And this is, and my, so why, why was not uh, uh, the investigation interested in the investigation? There were 10,000 people to, to investigate. They never returned to his theory. So for me, this is, uh, for me, was this, it was this memo which, uh, which was an important element. And Hans? I don't believe you can identify a specific detail or spe specific point in time when we felt we arrived at something which might resemble a conclusion. It's uh, rather a comprehensive assessment of the materials which have to do with Engstrom and all the circumstances making him stand out and uh, making him not fit the rest of the pattern. Okay, thank you. Moving on to YLE from Finland, but they're not, okay, they're not online. Moving on to the local. If the local is with us, yes. Hi. My question is, uh, so, many, so much time has passed. We have heard other solutions which were, which were presented earlier, which were not really solutions. Do you think the this solution will be accepted by the general public? Well, I can say that our task or my task as a prosecutor is to try to present evidence in order to prosecute. We have been working with this and we have arrived at uh, the conclusion that we have enough information that I would at least use cursive measures uh, with respect to this perpetrator, but since the perpetrator is dead, we cannot go to, we cannot turn to a court, we cannot have this issue tried, and we hope that our conclusions will be accepted by the general public. But I understand that this will, the different theories, different conspiracy theories will keep uh, afloat in the public domain the way it has done in the past 34 years, but we have found a conclusion which we feel that we can uh, stand behind. Do you have anything to add? Yes, I want to say I'm fully convinced that there are lots, lots of people who have other opinions different from ours and who are prone to believe in other solutions, but just like Krista said, these are our conclusions and this is what we believe in. Okay, thank you. We'll continue with etc. Hi. I have a question to Chris Patricia. Would this information been uh, sufficient to prosecute on this grounds if Engstrom would have been alive today? Like I said, I, I believe I said it before, and I believe, I believe that you realize this. In my opinion, this would have been enough that I could have used the measures which I, I'm in control of. I could have uh, apprehended, detained him if he wouldn't have been able to provide a satisfactory explanation. In my opinion is if, if I would turn to court with this information, this would be enough to remand him in custody and we'll be given more time to investigate the matter. The purpose of these cursive measures is to, was for example, to look for weapons, to conduct uh, forensic investigations. So this in itself wouldn't lead to a guilty verdict, but this would be uh, a part on the way. So it would pass the uh, limit of um, probable, or would end up to, uh, um, add up to the level of probable cause. Uh, New York Times? Can you hear me? Yes. I'm going to ask this in English, if that's all right. Uh, this is a question for Krister Pieterson. Uh, and that is, if you could tell, explain the role of journalist Thomas Pedersen in the investigation. Has he had a role, and what, what is that? Well, in Sweden, we don't uh, use civilians uh, as part of a pretrial investigation. He's an author of a book. 
uh, and he has uh, researched the case uh, and um, he has had no official position within the uh, investigation. Uh, he has come up with uh, the same ideas that we have come up with, but he, uh, I can't say that he has played any role in the investigation. Thank you. Um, Moving on to Berlinske, if you are with us. Can I ask the question in Danish? Can I, can I tell you, so you, you want to ask the question in Danish? Yes. Well, uh, please go ahead and ask the question. You said that the South Africa theory was interesting, but it wasn't specific. There was nothing specific. Could you say a little bit more about that? What do you mean that the it was interesting as a lead? Uh, no, I don't. no, well, I said that I believe that the motive is quite interesting in terms of the South African lead. It was uh, publicly known that Olaf Palmer opposed strongly the apartheid uh, regime criticized uh, the events in South Africa openly, uh, the what happened with the population there. But you could also say that this lead is not, th there's not a lot of specific information. It's more just an issue of a possible motive. A lot of resources, a lot of time has been invested in investigating this lead. And to a certain extent, it's also done today by so-called independent investigators. We haven't been able to arrive at anything of this level of specificity, which would uh, give us an opportunity to work, uh, to continue working with this issue in our assessment. Thank you. We'll continue with Swedish Radio, P1 documentary. They've probably left the meeting. English, I believe. Canadian Broadcasting. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Uh, I'm Yair Stein. I'm representing Munch Studios and uh, CBC, Canadian Broadcasting. I have a question for Christopher Peterson. Um, there are many people who spend years investigating the Palmer case on their own, um, who came to very different conclusions about what happened on the night of the murder than what you have presented today. Um, they also seem to have uh, compelling evidence, and they're probably listening now as well. What would you like to say to them if they tend to stick to their version of the truth and might continue their own investigations? Well, my general observation is that everybody has their right to the, their opinion and their theories, so that's no problem for me. Uh, what I can say is that uh, we, as uh, responsible uh, pre-trial investigation leaders, we have had access to all the material that have been collected by the police uh, service, and um, the um, so to say, private, uh, uh, not investigators, but the, the theorists, they haven't had the, the completely uh, complete material that we have had. So, of course, they, are, they have a right to have uh, their opinion, but I feel that we have a better ground to stand on when we have access to all material in the investigation. So, so that's all I can say about that. Thank you very much. Moving on to ARD. Let's see if ARD are with us. It doesn't seem to be the case. Moving further down the list, so we have AFP with us. for Christer Pietersson. Um, you've identified uh, Stig Engström by name. I'm wondering uh, if that means that you are 100% sure of your conclusions now, or is there any 
uh, any doubt in your mind? Well, um, as a prosecutor, as I said, you have to uh, get to, have to, to, to understand the Swedish system that uh, the only instance that can, can speak about guilt or non-guilt, that's the court. I have done my uh, piece of the investigation. I uh, am uh, convinced that there is ev evidence that points to uh, reasonable suspicion against uh, Engström, but I ca can't have it tried in a court of law. Uh, so uh, yes, I feel confident about our conclusions, but uh, I will not have the possibility to, to present it to a court and have them uh, have them. Uh, really examine the ex evidence uh, all the way, but I feel confident about the uh, findings that we have made. Thank you very much. Uh, we RTL, is RTL with us? I believe not, so we'll just continue på svenska. Uh, we'll continue in Swedish political. Uh, Political, uh, hey. hey. Can you hear me? Yes. My question is on the, if you can say anything about the motive. What could the motive has have been? This is also an issue which is difficult to assess after 34 years. We did a sketch, we described the Backgrounds of Stig Engstrom that there are certain, maybe not traces, but but uh, maybe some explanations of his actions. But this is something we would be able to investigate if uh, Stig Engstrom would have been arrested. So, but since he is not available, this will turn to speculations on my side, and this is something I would like to refrain from. We don't have a clear picture at this stage of what uh, what made uh, him snap. Um, thank you. Now it's Santi Dun. Um, your thank you. Uh, let me ask you a let me ask you an open question. The interest of, from the public has been uh, huge from the uh, from the journalists, from the independent investigators. Will more materials be made available to the general public and to the researchers? Well, what I can say is that during the course of the preliminary investigation, which this actually is and which it was when it was an active investigation, which has been ongoing for 34 years, it's almost a parts of your everyday life. But during the course of the preliminary investigation or pre-trial investigation, I, as a prosecutor, as the head of the investigation, I decide there's a, something called the confidentiality of the pre-trial investigation, which means that the materials we work on, we, were with, we want to work with these materials without disseminating them, without people getting informed about what we're actually doing. Once uh, the investigation has been discontinued, like this is the case here, the confidentiality is taken to another stage, so it's not only the pretrial investigation which decides the, the what the level of confidentiality will be, but it's the issue of the different individuals who are mentioned by name, by their uh, social security numbers. Uh, this long answer basically means is that we will not have any kind of open door policy with respect to the uh, to the uh, pre-trial investigation, but you can request that certain uh, where well, the second documents will be released, and this issue will be tried. And this is based on the confidentiality of the uh, personal integrity and uh, integrity of personal data. Anything to add there? No. Thank you, Gunnar Wall, author. Let's see if Gunnar Wall is there. It seems like the microphone is muted. I believe that you have to turn on your microphone. We can't really hear you.
ska vi göra så att vi eh, tar nästa på tur. Okej, okay, let's ask the next person on the list. We have Lars Borgnes from Semic from the Semic Publishing House. Yeah, hello. My question is to Christer Petersson. Are you saying that Lisbeth Palme could confuse Stig Engström with Christer Petersson, who she identified with a lot of certainty, which led to a guilty verdict in the district court, and the family has considered that this was a very certain identification. Are you trying to say that she actually saw uh, Stig Engström? Do you think they could be mixed up in, the, in terms of their looks? Well, I can say that Lisbeth Palmer's uh, information have been tried by the Court of Appeal, so I haven't any, any reasons to comment on what she did see or what she didn't see, whether she made a correct or incorrect certification. But I can say that there's something which has been tried, but which has been tried by a court. Thank you. Let's give Gunnar Wall another chance and see if, let's see if he's with us. Unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Unfortunately, we cannot hear you. So the last one on the list, and this is ARD. Is ARD with us? Can you hear me? Hello? Can we hear you? We can hear you. So we'll try to make sure that we can also see you, but we can hear you. Hey, hi. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. I want to know, Is does this mean that this case is over, or what would it look well, like in the future? Well, from the point of view of the prosecution and the police, my assessment is I have made a decision to discontinue the investigation, which means that the prosecution will not work actively on the investigation. If new information would appear, new information which would be of such a nature that it would raise interest that we'll have to investigate this information in more detail, then you can, there is an opportunity to continue, the, to reopen the investigation. But from my point of view, even from the point of view of the uh, prosecutions, the prosecution authority, the investigation is closed and I will not take any active measures after this. Okay, let's see if, let's give Kunagval a last, yeah. It sounds like we can hear you. Let's give it another go. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can, great. Let me ask the queer the question. And the question is about if I understand understood you correctly, you have been examining all those issues for three years. You didn't find any new evidence and what you have found would not be sufficient to prosecute, but you still want to discontinue uh, the whole case, although the case doesn't fall under the statute of limitations. Uh, my The question was whether this would lead to a prosecution to a guilty verdict, and as far as I can see, if we would have been able to use coercive measures, and for example, detain Stig Enstrom and uh, investigate, because normally you don't in uh, prosecute someone right after the arrest, but you take different investigative measures. And it wouldn't be improbable to believe it's not, not we're not the only people who have been working with this for three the last three years. People have been working on this issue before that. And uh, Stig Engstrom what I was just against him it appears to be a suspected perpetrator. So no matter how much time we spend on this, the question is, how do we fit Stig Engstrom's uh, information into this jigsaw puzzles? And our conclusion is that he played a central part in the incident. Thank you. Anyone else left? Last uh, one we 
which uh, disconnects us earlier, and I believe it's Munk. Is Munk or Monk with us? Yeah, here we go. press conference but I would like to ask uh, so this is uh, at least the second time you're trying with uh, uh, a lone killer um, and uh, the case against Krista Pedersen must have been uh, considered much stronger than this one and you're actually saying that the police and the prosecutor uh, got it wrong that time why should we trust you this time well it's your opinion that that, that case was stronger it was tried twice in court and he was acquitted uh, so uh, it's your uh, characterization that that uh, was a stronger case than this one. Uh, as we have tried to explain during these hours in this morning, our uh, findings about this, and uh, it's been enough to convince us to present this case, and we hope that this will, will, will be accepted by the uh, public as well. But. Uh, we can't uh, stop anyone from having opinions about what we have found. Thank you very much. Do right, I think that that then will round off this press conference. Thank you very much for your participation and also all the journalists who asked their questions and who followed this press conference here today. Thank you very much. Thank you.